Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, earlier on you heard me uh, uh, really speaking on behalf of the First Lady. Uh, now I will speak uh, in my own behalf, both as the director of the Library of Alexandria and also as an environmentalist of some long uh, duration. Uh, my former boss and mentor, uh, Bob Picciotto, is here and he would attest to the fact that uh, I made my first reputation by building very complex mathematical models uh, on uh, simulation of labor flows uh, with 15,000 rows and 20,000 matrices, matrices, very large problems at a time when computers weren't all that great. So I've selected a title for my talk as an equation, three Fs and two Cs. And frankly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I mean, while I fully endorse what His Excellency Dr. Mustafa Kamal Tolba has said about the importance of working over the long haul, I want to present a rather dire and alarming view. And what I'm talking about is immediate. It is about the fact that we are going to have severe problems over the next few years that are going to be exacerbated by climate change. And that's where the three Fs and the two Cs come in. They stand for food, feed, and fuel, which is a unique situation we are in right now, and the two Cs are for climate change. And I think that unless we affect the policies on food, feed, and fuel, we are going to have a disaster because agricultural output will not be able to cope with demand. And if that happens, prices will continue to go up and the accessibility of food to large proportions of humanity will be undermined. Now, we have to remind ourselves with these very wise words that we are all on this earth as guests of the green plants and those who tend them. And that, of course, is a bow to Minister Amin Abaza and the agricultural sector. We are here, we exist, cities, civilizations, because of agriculture and agricultural surpluses. And that takes me to the three Fs, the food, the feed, and the fuel. The food, we are talking about food security. We expect two and a half billion more people on the planet. We want to have food accessible at all places, at all times, at accessible prices, without destroying the patrimony of the environment in so doing. The response, therefore, will be to produce differently, not less. That means we have to produce more, but differently. It will not be feasible to just produce in some corners of the globe and ship food elsewhere. And in fact, we're going to have to reach to the smallholder farmer everywhere in the world. And that is a very big challenge at the local level. And here, of course, we come to His Excellency Sarab Salam Mahgoub, Minister of Local Government, because that is where a lot of the action will be done. So food security to provide access to sufficient food by all people at all times is a situation where we have a problem because where there are surpluses and the prices are high, we have people who cannot afford these surpluses. And thus we have a problem. But in fact, we do not have surpluses. We're going to have shortages if this continues. Production is a necessary but not sufficient condition for food security. That is true. But if we look at this, let us reflect on the following. These are old forecasts, but they are still reasonably valid. If you look at this, share of increased demand by 2020, the developed countries account for only 16%, and the, in the, the developing countries will need about 85% of the net additional food production. When it comes to roots and tubers, the developed countries account for 3%, less than 3%. 97% are developing countries. And the same is true in meat products. Only 16% to the industrial countries and about 85% for the developing countries. Now, mind you, this forecast is based on an assumption that as incomes rise, India will still not significantly increase its animal protein because of cultural and religious reasons. But that is an assumption. If that assumption does not hold, the demand will be that much greater. And that is a very serious problem indeed. So we can either increase the area under cultivation with its own problems or increase the yields. And if we look at high input agriculture, 
it has been a disaster. In the last 50 years, fertilizer use increased 23-fold, 23 times. Pesticides, 53 times, with all the concomitant environmental damage. Can science bring about sustained, precision, ecologically balanced agriculture? Yes, I believe so. Certainly the CGIR and other institutions believe so. So we have to increase biological yields, improve nutrient content, intensify agriculture, and manage natural resources sustainably with science moving from what was known in the 70s as the green revolution to a doubly green revolution. We also have to expand our narrow food base. What do I mean by that? Well, we have about 250,000 plants are known. Most are not edible, many are poisonous, but at least 20,000 are edible. 3,000 were sampled, only a few hundred were cultivated, 100 were seriously cultivated, were in crop lists some 50 years ago, and 12 crops account for 95% of all human food base today, only 12 crops. And if you want the big four, talking about rice, wheat, maize, and potatoes, they account for 80% of that. So we have a very narrow food base. We need to expand that to other plants like barley and sorghum, which are more resistant. And luckily, we have the gene banks now to be able to do this kind of work, to move from a green revolution to a doubly green revolution with more genetically diverse crops, with less reliance on pesticides, more interaction with nature and biological controls, to integrate soil, water, and nutrient management, and to recognize the gender dimension, because in Africa, certainly, this farmer, she produces 80% of the food or receives only 10% of the wages and owns 1% of the land. We need to promote alternatives to slash and burn in sub-Saharan Africa to reduce post-harvest losses that sometimes reach 30% and increase the nutritional content of the food because at the end of the day, the purpose of agricultural production is to feed people. And in so doing, let us always choose pro-poor, pro-women, and pro-environment policies. There is a widespread and accepted use of modern molecular genetics in some issues like tissue sampling, marker-aided assistance, and the new biology, however, opens totally new possibilities. Now, with our genetic understanding, going towards quantitative trade loci, we can be much more effective in selecting for valuable genes rather than in judging on the phenotype. And we can move towards the use of biotechnology and the genetic imperative in improving agricultural work by combining traditional wisdom with modern science. Now, different regions will need to address different problems, but all will require the best of science, and that requires that we reinforce our scientific research capability, especially in agriculture, but focusing on the problems of the poor, not on fancy problems for the rich. I used to use this slide a long time ago, and I used to say, where is the future of biotechnology? And I said we would be assembling genomes like Lego sets and that maybe American farmers would be producing huge amounts. That is a cartoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is not. This is a cucumber. That is a cartoon. This is not. So uh, the question is, why can't we have super uplined rice that is uh, high-yielding, disease-resistant, cold-tolerant, pest-tolerant, with perennial stems, erosion-minimizing, weed-suppressant, drought-tolerant, adapted to adverse soils, nitrogen-fixing, and deep-rooted. Why not? We could, if there was a willingness to concentrate scientific ability on the needs of the poor. And that is a challenge. We have seen it done. In nutrition, for example, golden rice, contrary to what people said in terms of the fears of genetic resources, all the academies of science of the world have said that it is the final proteins that count, not how it got there. We can improve nutrition, and the case of golden rice, vitamin A rice, as you probably all know, is an important case because vitamin A deficiency is killing half a million children and blinding 14 million a year. It can be improved for the poorest of the poor this way. This is another example. It has nothing to do with pigs. This is one of my favorite slides. It is actually quality protein maize. These two pigs are twins. The small pig was fed regular maize. The big pig was fed quality protein maize. Now, I do not know of a better and more powerful way of making the case that biofortification of crops is an important solution to think about, not just in increasing the tonnage that is produced, but the quality of the food that comes from that tonnage. We're talking even of edible vaccines. 
Ultimately, longer, more productive lives is what we're talking about. But challenging food for the same amount of production is the problem of feed. There is a livestock revolution driven by rising incomes, especially in China. Now, meat is going to increase, milk is going to increase, eggs are going to increase, animal proteins are going to increase, and these will require feed because this is an FAO forecast of the huge expansion of feed requirements from 400 to uh, over 1,400 uh, over a 40-year period. These will largely be met by terrible industrial methods, not by the small farmers. This is a rapidly disappearing creature, the, the free-ranging chicken that no longer exists anymore. This is how chickens are produced today almost everywhere with the problems of disease, of avian flu, of other problems associated with it, as you well know. There's not enough rangeland to graze cows anymore. Increasingly, we'll have to rely on animal feed to deal with that. And milk, of course, is an important source, and it's a source that will also require feeding cows. Now, the problem is that beef converts at 7 to 1 ratio. That's what people say. But they miss the point, because you have to add what is known as carcass yield. In other words, you do not get every kilo of the weight of a cow to be eaten. So the cow converts seven to one, seven kilos of grain to one kilo of cow, and then you only get 0.6 of that kilo at the end. That is known as the carcass yield. Chickens are somewhat better two to one, have a 70% carcass yield. Egg production has two to one yield, but every one of them is a multiplier effect difference from humans eating the grain itself. So the feed revolution is putting a major pressure, especially, especially on maize or corn. Now comes fuel. And that was mentioned briefly by the First Lady when she said burning the, the food of the poor to drive the cars of the rich. That is really the challenge. We have large production that is being subsidized in the United States to move away from food and feed towards biofuel production. And this has acquired an enormous political campaign. Look at this image here, Uncle Sam, just like during the war, I want you, and capturing the public imagination. This is National Geographic, it's not a scientific journal, but it shows, in fact, the wrong way and the right way of doing it. How green are these biofuels? Well, you'd be surprised to know that almost all of them are not green at all. In fact, they have hardly any balanced contribution to the environment. If you look at corn, ethanol, cellulosic grasses, and biodiesel from algae, for example, we find very big differences. Especially the corn ethanol being subsidized in the United States is at best either a wash or it, the best examples are 1.27, so a 27% increase uh, uh, in uh, uh, benefits environmentally. The grasses are much better because they regrow, as you know, a grass regrows from the root, doesn't have to be replanted if it is properly harvested. And thus we can get anywhere from one to eight depending on the harvesting system. But there's possibilities from the sea. Biodiesel from algae, for example, is something to be explored. This is being done in Germany. This example is in, from Germany here, which we begin to see how they're being to used. Sugarcane in Brazil is the most expensive system used so far to date. It has about a 2 to 1 ratio, 30% improvement in uh, gasoline efficiency. And it has a problem, however, on human cost of those who tend the, the sugarcane. It's a very tough job, very uh, unhealthy. But the government says these are very poor people who otherwise would not have a job. So it's an issue what to do with it. Other biofuels, well, soya has been tried, other things have been tried. But how about the new synthetic biology? Well, remember I said we'd be assembling genomes like Lego sets. Already my friend Craig Venter has filed patents for a synthetic life form, which he proposes actually to use for a single cell organism that will produce biofuels that will be truly green. This is the numbers of the patent filed in the United States. And this is the WIPO patent for 100 countries. So I'm talking about science today, a synthetic life form done in the laboratory to produce biofuels. The future of that combination of food, feed, and fuel, I don't know. But surely, at over $100 a barrel in oil, we should not be subsidizing, subsidizing the transformation of food and feed into fuel. 
The current policies, especially the subsidies of ethanol, have resulted in a disaster. Not only six billion were spent on that, but the 51 per cent per gallon domestic subsidy and 54 cent per gallon tariff has resulted in an enormous increase in the amount of land that is allocated away from food production towards bioethanol production with a, a, a huge challenge. If the target set by the Bush administration is to be met, by 2017 the entire U.S. corn harvest would have to go for bioethanol. Now that means you withdraw from production for food and feed a huge production of maize with an enormous impact on prices. The price of corn already rose nearly 80% in 2006 and another 80% in 2007. And in Mexico, we have had, which is very poor, and which uses tortillas, which is a corn-based. Here in Egypt, we use bread, which is wheat-based, but they use the corn or maize-based. And they have had riots, the tortilla riots in Mexico as the prices went up. And we've had many such protests elsewhere. Now, not only that, but the environmental impact has been disastrous because if you continue to pursue that food, feed, fuel combination on agriculture, we will have to expand very significantly the amount of land under cultivation at a time when natural ecosystems are disappearing very rapidly. So the cost on the environment of taking away forest and, and putting it into agriculture, especially monoculture, will be very bad on climate change as well. These are all the various ecosystems and the degree of impact we've had on marine fisheries, bird extinctions, CO2 concentrations, water use, fertilizer, etc. I would submit that the most important environmental action is to reduce the need for more land under cultivation. If we can protect the existing forests, that will be a big thing. If we lose them, that's a big cost. And that is unfortunately 70% of the land transformed by humans, 44% of the total land mass of the planet has been transformed for agriculture. Saving agriculture saves habitats and biodiversity, and it touches not only what's on land, but also in the seas. And reducing pollutants is equally essential, not only for water, but for runoff into the habitats themselves. And water is extremely important. Agriculture uses two-thirds of global water withdrawals, 80 to 90 percent in developing countries. This is my scariest statistic. One calorie equals one liter of water. So a 2,700 calorie diet per day means that every person consumes 2,700 liters of fresh water per day. It's transformed in the form of food. It doesn't drink it, but it's transformed into the form of food. And that is the average global figure today. The radio have seen the Yellow River did not reach the sea in 220 days in 97. Imagine if that happens to the Nile. The Nile reaches Cairo with about 12 million tons of salt, reaches the sea with 34 million tons of salt. If it doesn't, these 34 million tons of salt will stay in the delta and destroy the agricultural land there. In the last 100 years, 50% of the world's wetlands have been lost and transformed, partly into development, but partly also into agriculture. And underground water is being mined at unsustainable rates, usually subsidized energy. We are drawing down the water tables in Syria. It is dropping at a meter a year. And at the bottom of it, in places like the Sahel, this is what you find at the bottom. And with that comes desertification and a new form of environmental refugees. Those who think this is unreasonable, remember a few years ago in Niger. Niger, a drought affected uh, a serious situation where almost 3 million people were going to, to, to die. But at the, time, at the time, we had our coffers of food supply available. Today, the buffer stocks are way down. The prices are way up. Any such shortage is going to result in a major, major catastrophe. So we need more crop per drop. We need supplemental irrigation. We need to reduce pollution. We need to use new tools like bioremediation, reuse treated wastewater, and so much more. Now, to this, we add the two Cs, the climate change, the most serious issue. I think I don't need to go through the figures. Everybody here has seen these pictures and understands the climate system. But here is where adaptation, mitigation, and adaptation come in between our socioeconomic development path and climate change with emissions and concentrations and the impacts on the ecosystems. These are the barriers we need to activate fairly on. The evidence is overwhelming, as was said. The, this comes from a study that I urge people to look at, which is the Nicholas Stern study on what are the likely impacts in economic terms 
on different parts of the world system. And you have there a whole range of issues on food, water, ecosystems, and other events. And that did not take into account this 3F food, feed, fuel combination we're talking about. The models predict more variability, and we have been witnessing that. This is the flow of hurricane tracks in the 10 years leading to the mid-90s, the hurricane tracks the 10 years after that. Previous 10 years, most recent 10 years. Who can deny this? It, the disastrous results of that you can see in these pictures that you can see here. Hurricane Katrina reminds us from New Orleans what happened. This cartoon, which I like, they say, how the climate people, how can we get Mr. Bush interested? He said, let's call the next hurricane Osama <laughs> instead of calling it Katrina and see what we do. So these storms are real and the melting of the ice caps is a reality and different scenarios of sea level rise are going to have a major impact on the places like Florida, maybe because Disney World will be affected, maybe people will take notice. But for us here, uh, looking at where 0.5 meter or 1 meter of land would affect, this is where the intrusion of salt water is likely to come into in terms of agricultural land. It's an enormous impact on 6 million people, as you can see here. The coral reefs, another source of biodiversity for which Egypt is very wealthy, is disappearing rapidly. From magical gardens, we are getting dead landscapes, partly through bleaching and dying. So what do we do? Well, energy, yes. We need to change our attitude towards cleaner energy. Wiser policies are needed. Biofuels are not the answer. Certainly, we need to do something on transport, mass transport. There's, you can see here, fuel cell buses beginning to appear. But let's rethink of renewables, from uh, uh, wind energy to modern wind energy, from uh, small uh, examples of photovoltaics to huge examples of photovoltaics. This is a huge factory, all photovoltaic in Germany, to the power of the atom. After all, why not? We need to revisit all options. The poor have to be at the forefront of our concern. Most farmers live precariously. They will not be able to cope with the impacts of climate change. Now, this map is very important because it shows you how the growing season is going to be reduced in Africa. Yes, the, some people will tell you, but some places are going to, be, to increase. Yes, here they are, the green, the green spots. You see those green spots? Those are going to improve. Everything else is massively negative. Oh, yes, there are one or two places that are going to be better off, but the vast majority of Africa is going to be much better, worse off. We will have floods and we will have droughts. And that is the reality. And for farmers like these, their ability to cope with that is much reduced. That variability was already real. But look at this variability. This is it over the long term. This is the same variability of climate over the long term. Can anybody deny that, in fact, the trend is very clearly going towards a reduction of the net available rainfall, a reduction of the net available water, for producing the food that will be required for the people. And there's so much more. And our own behavior, we need public education, community-based actions, we need behavioral change on consumption, on the destruction of the environment, on waste. This, incidentally, is old tires in the United States. Uh, one of the most difficult things to get rid of, old tires. And poverty and social marginalization, a new role for women, and dialogue and cooperation instead of wars and to address priorities, more crop per drop, more food security rather than biofuels, more attention to better agriculture. Immediate improvements are possible. Let's not wait for totally new technologies. Some places are possible. Mitigation versus remedial actions. We talked about what you do about that. Adaptation, accommodation, or protection are different ways to harness new technologies like nanotechnologies, remote sensing, and biotechnology. A lot more can be done. I think time is running out, and we must all work together for the benefit of the next generation and for the whole world. Thank you.